go ahead and get out your bulletins. Today we begin a brand new series that is um, something we actually do and we've participated every year that we've been a church up here in Leavenworth. This is a series that we call What If the Church? And this year we're asking a question with many other churches in Kansas City because this series is actually not just something we do, but we do it in partnership with this year over 40 other churches in the Kansas City area. And just to give you a little bit of a, a backstory and the context into this is over the last 10 years, there has been a gathering, a cooperation, a collaboration, if you will, of churches who have every year asked this question, what if the church? And together, over 40 churches, actually over 90 churches have been a part of this over the last 10 years where we gather together and we asked this question, what would it look like if the church just focused our energies together and we saw ourselves as a church that is a capital C church, not just little individual C churches, but what if we let down our differences and joined one mission together and collaborated and put our efforts together and, and focused together on how we can be Jesus and bring his kingdom to our communities. And so we are joining other people in the metro area, in the Kansas City metro area, other churches from not just here in Leavenworth, but we're joining with um, Wallula specifically, and we're also joining with the many, uh, 40 other churches, even all the way through Lee Summit and Independence on the other side of Kansas City. And we are joining and we are doing this series together. We're teaching the same content. We're going to be engaging in, 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 in focused activity to reach our city and our neighbors and our loved ones. And we're asking this question that's a series big idea idea for this entire series. It's going to be the common thread. I want you to go ahead and write this in your notes. It's a question that says this and asks this. What if the church loves the city by praying, sharing, and caring? What if the church, the capital C church, what if we would love the city? Not just say, hey, we're in the city, but what if we actively participated in loving our city. And we can look at Leavenworth and say, yes, we are part of the big Kansas City metro. And when we love our city, we are loving the, ca the, the, the big church and th we are joining the big church in Kansas City to love the, the metro of Kansas City. And what would it look like if churches gathered together and say, hey, we're going to love the city. And the first way we're going to love the city is by praying for them. We're, that's what we're going to look at today. And then next week, we're going to look at what it would it look like to be a church who's caring for our city. And if you're here and you're in town next week or you don't have vacation plans, I encourage you to be here next week because next week we're going to do something that's never been done in our church before. And I encourage, I, actually, I, I was thinking about it. I don't know if many churches have done something like this next week. So you don't want to miss next week. If you're here next week, you're going to be able to participate in us together, making a big impact in our city in a very simple way that every one of us can do. And you will be empowered to do this, so please don't miss next Sunday. Also, another thing about next Sunday is we are going to have kids' classes for preschool, I mean, kindergarten and under. So our first grader, graders and above are going to join us in the service, and they're going to be able to participate in this too. And we're going to empower you with a way that you can care for the people with whom you live, work, and play. And we're going to see how, how we can love our city by caring for our city. And then we're going to look in the third week of what it would it look like to love our city enough to share with our city. And not share our needs, because that's about caring, but share our story with the people with whom we live, work, and play. Share the story of, that, that's your story, that's personal to you, of a, a story where God's been working in your life. And what would it look like to love someone enough to share that story of how God has transformed you and he wants to transform someone else? See, what would it look like if not just our church, but we join with Wallula as they're doing the series with us again this year, and we join with Pastor Lance in their community, and what would it look like if our two churches and other churches of the Kansas City Metro gathered together and said, we want to love our city by praying, caring, and sharing? See, I believe this, the church is an extension of Jesus. Jesus said, I am going to build my church, and, and it's through, I believe, the church that the mission of Jesus continues to come. And Jesus had a specific mission that I believe the church is to carry out, and this is what Jesus' mission is. I want you to write this in your notes. I believe Jesus came to bring his kingdom to earth by saving all who trust in him and surrender to his authority. What did Jesus come to do? He came with a message, and his message was the kingdom of God. And what did the kingdom of God mean? It was that he was reestablishing his reign and his rule as king on earth. 
And he was reestablishing what, what, what sin had destroyed and taking authority away. He's like, no, I'm coming. I'm bringing my authority back. I'm bringing my reign back. And it's not in the way that kings of the earth rule. But this is a reign that comes when we put our trust, we believe in him, and we believe enough in him to surrender our lives to him as our Savior and our Lord. And when we surrender our lives to him, his authority comes into my life and your life for all who believe. And his kingdom is what he's bringing to this earth. And the way he's bringing his kingdom is by rescuing those of us who need a Savior, who realize that without Jesus, we, are, we will lose life forever. And without Jesus, we can't save ourselves, but he comes to show us that he loved us enough to save us. And when we trust in him by believing in him, we surrender our lives to him, his authority comes to us. And that's when his kingdom comes, is when his kingdom comes through the hearts and the lives of the people that he came to rescue. And today we're going to look at how we can join Jesus in his mission of that, bringing in his kingdom, by engaging in prayer. And prayer is, might be something, Casey, I do this. But today I want to challenge your prayer. Because maybe, maybe we don't pray in the way that unlocks the kingdom possibilities. Maybe we don't pray in the way that unlocks what God really wants to do in our city. That Jesus has been at work doing since he came to this earth. And maybe what today we could do is realign ourselves and realign our prayers in a different way. To where we could see the kingdom possibility being leveraged in our life through our prayers to impact our city because we care for the things that Jesus cares about and we love the things that Jesus cares about and Jesus loves the people of our city. So I want us to go to Mark chapter 9 today. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. And in order to, to set this up, I, I want to talk about the context of what's going on here. Mark, first of all, the, this gospel of Mark, which we call the gospel, which is the story, the good news story of Jesus that Mark tells. In this story, Mark is, is, is a, a early first century disciple, a follower of Jesus. And he wasn't one of the 12 disciples. He actually was good friends with Peter, who is in the inner three of Jesus' closest leadership circle. And in this, Mark followed, was, was close friends with Peter and got all of his information about Jesus through a firsthand telling that Peter would say. And so Mark puts together this story, this good news story. Of, of the gospel of Mark, uh, of gospel of Jesus, and we call it the book of Mark, and that's why we have it. And in this, Mark begins to tell about this time in Jesus' period where he is at the pinnacle of ministry. See, Jesus at this moment, he had just fed the sec for the second time a multitude of people with just a couple loaves and a couple fish. And in this, this second time, he distributed and through a miracle of just making a mass uh, a meal out of a, a basket of bread and two fish. He feeds over 4,000 people. The second time he's done this, people are now in awe of what Jesus can now do. And now Jesus is showing him that they, I have authority to provide. And then he goes on after this and he goes on to, talk, to go through the area and he finds a blind man. And he finds this blind man who has been blind since birth. He was born this way, that, that his DNA would not allow him to see. And Jesus does something miraculous. He spits in the mud, and out of the dirt by which man was formed at the beginning, he puts his DNA in the mud, his divine DNA, through his spittle. And he puts it on the man's eyes. And he says, I have the authority to recreate. And he brings sight to a blind man's eyes eyes. See, Jesus is doing things that's showing his authority, his kingdom coming, his authority on earth. And then his, his disciples are also a part of this, and his disciples have, have seen this, and they're, they're at their peak of ministry, too, because they're a part of Jesus, and they were the ones that actually distributed the bread and the fish. And as they were distributing the bread, it was through their act that the miracle was taking place, and so Jesus used them to do this miracle. And you can maybe imagine with me that the confidence that these disciples were having that Man, we're with Jesus, and we're getting to participate in these miracles. They were there with Jesus healing the blind man. And three of the disciples, James, Peter, and John, Jesus' closest inner circle, had this amazing moment 
when Jesus brings them and they go to this mountain and in a weird way they are like lifted up and next thing you know James, Peter, and John are like looking at each other and they're like saying okay we're with Jesus but there's two other people here and the one person is the rock star of the Old Testament Moses himself the man who was the rock star that brought the law of God that everything that we knew that we would connect with God was brought through Moses. And here, Moses stands before Jesus. And now, another rock star that represented all the prophets, Elijah himself, stands there. And these two men are facing Jesus. That everything that the law and the prophets hung on are now looking to Jesus. And a voice from heaven says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Not these are my prophets but they show now and they turn to Jesus and Jesus is acknowledged by God by having all the authority that everything that the law and the prophets was there is now summed up in Jesus and Jesus then with his disciples has this amazing moment but while they're having this amazing moment there's an amazing argument happening with the nine other disciples and some religious lawyers and so in this they Jesus and his three disciples, they come down off the mountain, they go back and they find the disciples arguing. And Jesus comes and goes, hey, what's this? What are you arguing about? What's up here? And, and, and one of the men in the crowd who kind of is the, the point person in, the, in where all of the center of this commotion and argument is all about, he says, hey, Jesus, I'll tell you, I brought my boy to your disciples. In fact, let me tell you why I brought my boy to your disciples. Because my boy has suffered for a long time. And he has had a demon inside of him. And this demon takes him and uncontrollably throws him to the ground. It makes him convulse. It makes him foam in his mouth. And, and it, it, it wants to kill him. And, it, and he turns rigid as a board. I brought him to your disciples. You know, you're, the people that hung out and do all these miracles, but they couldn't do anything for my boy. So I'm bringing him to you. And then Jesus looks, not necessarily at this man, but I think he looks at the people around and he says this statement that we're going to start reading right here. He says, you unbelieving generation. Just pause for a minute. You unbelieving I believe this is what Jesus' entire message was focused on. People who would believe in him. And he looks at these people and says, you unbelieving generation. He was bringing, see, Jesus was bringing his kingdom. He was bringing his authority. But he was bringing his authority to those who would believe and trust and have faith in him. And his authority couldn't come. And his, his authority couldn't come into someone's life unless there was belief in who he was. And Jesus replies to them, how long, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So almost exasperated, Jesus says, just bring him to me. And since these boys can't do it, bring the boy to me and Jesus asks the boy's father hey how long has he been like this and maybe in this way that Jesus is now saying hey I want you to tell everybody else how long have you been dealing with this because I want people to know that this is no longer going to have authority in his life and in this the man replies since childhood it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him and then in this begging plea that any father I think who loves their child any father who who's, wants to see life in their kids and, and wants to see God and, and loves their kids the way any parent would love a kid, he looks to Jesus and says this, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And that word take pity is like, will you, will you be moved with compassion on us? And will you help us? Will you rescue us? Will you come and do what we can't do for ourselves? And almost in a moment here, it's like Jesus is like, if you can, do, 
do you not understand who I am? And you ask me if I can? He says, if you can. And then I want you to underline this. Because he says, everything is possible for those, for one, everything is possible for one who believes. What's possible? Everything. For who? Not those who can tick the box and go to church. Not those for, who, can, who can say, hey, I, I've done this good deed. Because look at what the disciples, the disciples were doing good deeds left and right. But everything is possible. And the key to unlocking the possibility of the kingdom of God is not in our behavior, it's not in our action, it's not in our doing, it's in something else that triggers it all. It's in our ability to believe. It's in this belief set. It's in trusting in who Jesus is. He says everything is possible to one for one who believes. I believe believe unlocks the possibility of the kingdom of God. And maybe Jesus didn't say this for the crowd's sake. Maybe Jesus, you know, I believe said it for the, the man's sake, the father's sake, but I think really Jesus was saying this for his disciples' sake. He was saying this, hey, you know what? Everything's possible. What you couldn't do, what was impossible for you, is possible when you believe. And so what's the father do? Immediately he exclaims, as I would have too. I do believe. That's why I brought him to you. But then there's this prayer that I love that the, this man prays. He goes, help me <laughs> with my, overcome my un." You know, maybe you're here today and you're not a Christ follower. And you say, you know, I, I want to believe in God and, and, and I want to. And maybe you can just start here today and with this man and say, God, make this your prayer. Will you help me overcome my unbelief? Maybe you're a Christ follower and, and you've, you've, you believe in God, but you haven't believed in the way that, that God has leveraged your life to unlock the kingdom possibility and you want to get there. And you can say, God, will you help me overcome my unbelief? That the area in my life that I just don't believe, will you help me overcome? And when, if we could come to that, say, and we could join this Father today and say, Father in heaven, Jesus, will you help us overcome our unbelief? belief. When Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, in order to, to not make this a big scene, he rebukes the impure spirit and he says, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus who is on mission to bring dead things to life, to bring spiritually dead things back to life. He uses this opportunity to show his authority over in every, all death, hell, its grave. And even though he wasn't dead, he was as like a dead man in, in that his body looked lifeless. Jesus does something. He takes him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and the boy stands up. And after Jesus had gone indoors, Mark continues to write about what happens in the story. <laughs> His disciples gather him together and say, okay, Jesus, what's the deal? You told us. I mean, th this is me reading into this, okay? So this is not exactly what it is in Scripture. But you told us that we could cast out demons. You told us that we could heal the sick. You told us that we could even raise the dead. Why, why, why can't we do this? And Jesus looks at them just as simply as anything. And when they said, why can't we, why couldn't we drive it out? Why couldn't we be the ones that, that, that you used to bring this out? And he replies, this kind can only come out by prayer. Well, I pray. I mean, I would think a lot of us pray. Maybe not as often as we would want to pray. But God how could we be using that kind of prayer to bring that kind of impact on our city? 
And how can we look at maybe posture ourselves with the disciples? Because after this, I believe the disciples had an opportunity to really think about this. Because they, went, they, went, they traveled through Galilee, which is a good day's journey. And they had a lot of time to think. And maybe we need to think about, God, what is it in our life that, that you want to do through us? That you wanted to do through us by us praying? Because this is why. I believe that it's prayer that inspires our belief. It's not our belief that inspires us to pray. I believe that through our prayer, it inspires us to believe in God. That this boy in this story desperately needed the power of God and the kingdom of God to come into his life. But the disciples were not able to bring that kingdom because Jesus clearly said it's because there was no belief. There was no faith. And the faith that I believe the trust that Jesus is talking about, that these disciples even lack themselves, comes through prayer. So what do you know about this kind of prayer? I believe Jesus knew something about prayer. See, Jesus would, would pray in a different way, and he marveled the, the disciples, and he talked about prayer in a different way. He even talked about the temple, that, that this place, this house of worship back then, was, was a, a house of prayer. And now that we are in the, the, the new era of what Jesus has brought, that there is no longer a place that we connect with God, that we don't have to come to a, a, a temple, if you will, a church, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and that there is a direct connection here that we have with God. What could we learn about prayer, knowing that we can directly connect with God? See, Jesus, I believe, he, he didn't say knowledge unlocks the possibility the kingdom possibility. He said believing unlocks the possibility. It unlocks the possibility and Jesus connects prayer to our belief. That maybe maybe the th reason we're not praying, the, 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 believing the right things is because we're not directly praying the right things. So what is prayer? I mean, you might think, Casey, I know what prayer is. Well, maybe you do. The simple answer to that is this. Prayer, write this in, is talking and listening to God. Wait, Casey, I thought it was just talking to God. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? Talk with God. I get that. No, see, prayer is more than just talking with God. Prayer is listening to him, too. And a lot of times, maybe you're like me, that I get caught up in airing like everything that I want God to do for me. And then I forget to listen for what he wants me to do for him. And so a lot of times in my life, you know, I've got, man, I've got five, ten minutes. Okay, God, okay, you listening? Because I want to make sure this line is, is this line working? Okay, we got a clear connection? Good, let's go. My mom, my wife, my, my kids, and we go through the list. Oh, and we get lucky, my neighbor too. Done. Okay, got to go to work. I mean, prayer is, I mean, that's, that's what we do, isn't it? I mean, if we get to pray, it's like... Boom, here's my list, everything I want you to do for me. But what if prayer is more than that? What if the prayer that is a kingdom impacting prayer, a prayer that can change our city, that a church could engage in, is when we do less talking and more listening? A prayer that can engage, a prayer that engages our belief in him. See, let me tell you a couple things about prayer that I believe. First, I believe this, that not praying can prevent God working through us. We see this in the story, that we just that because the disciples weren't engaged in prayer, they weren't able to believe what God wanted them to believe. See, not praying can prevent God working through us. Maybe the disciples couldn't carry out God's plan because they weren't listening to know God's plan. Maybe God isn't using us to work in bringing his kingdom as he wants to and as we want to because we're not listening when we pray, we do all the talking. We don't engage in listening. And we, because we're not praying the way that he wants us to pray by not just talking, but by also listening, we're preventing God from using us because he wants to use us. Second thing I know about prayer is prayer prepares us for people's problems. And yes, that's an alliteration. It prepares us for people's problems. You know what prayer does? It's put, it puts me in a posture to be with the needy. It positions my heart 
It, it prepares me for the people that God loves the most. And see, and see, here's my problem. Maybe this is just me. But sometimes I try to avoid people's problems. And you're like, Casey, you're the pastor. I don't want you to avoid my problems. You know what problems are? They're messy. They're demanding. And sometimes as Christ followers, I think we, we avoid the problems because we're not listening to God who has a heart for the people. And what would it look like if we engaged the people the way Jesus had compassion on the people? And we said, God, I want to see them the way you see them. And when I see the people the way you see them, I'm okay with their problems. I'm okay to get a little messy. I'm okay that it demands a little more of me. But I want to position myself to where I know the people, and I want, to, I, I want you to prepare me for the problems. Jesus would go out daily, and I believe he would go out every morning, and he would stand. Scripture tells us he would go in the morning to pray. And when he would pray, I believe God was downloading and getting Jesus ready for the problems of the people he was going to face. And he was giving them the message. See, prayer puts us in a posture for people's problems. And then write this in. Prayer positions us to depend upon God and be used by him. What does prayer do? It positions you to be used by him. It positions you to be used by him. See, prayer helps us see people the way God sees people, and it puts us in a position to now you do and minister to the people the way God wants us to minister to them. See, maybe the disciples weren't depending upon God's authority, and they were trying to depend upon their own. Maybe they were trying to, to do it in their own effort. They, they said, God, we weren't, we're not depending it upon, on yours. See, that's what prayer does. It throws our dependence on a God who has all the authority and says, God, we need you to come rescue through us. But a lot of times we get stuck in this thing of prayer. See, back to this idea that it's about my list. See, prayer is not getting God to do what I want. Prayer is God getting me What if the church began to pray like that? That's a teaching big idea that I want to leave you with. What if we, the church, what if we joined with Wallula, what if we joined with all the other churches and said, God, it's not about what we want anymore. It's about what you want. And we want to align ourselves with what you want. So write this in your notes. What if we made a daily habit of aligning ourselves with what God is doing? What would that look like in your life? To every day, make a habit. Create this as a daily rhythm, a daily habit that wherever you are and whenever you wake up and however you can start your day or wherever part of your day that you can say, God, I'm going to align myself. I'm going to make a daily habit of aligning myself with what you want to do, not with what I want you to do for me. But God, I want to align myself with what you're already doing in the lives of the people around me. The, the people I work with, the people I live with in my home, the people that, that they're in my neighborhood, the people I enjoy life and I do all these fun things with. God, what, I, what if I just postured myself in a day, every day, and say, God, how can I align myself with what you're doing for me? What would happen? What would happen if hundreds of us here in Leavenworth, thousands of us, joined together? Because there's probably over 1,000 people between our ch two churches. Over, actually, probably about 1,500 of all the people that call Westside home and all the people that call uh, Wallula home. What would it look like if we gathered together and we said, we're going to align ourselves, Jesus, not with what you, we want you to do for us, but what do you want to do through us? So how do we do that? I want to offer you four just ideas to create a habit of daily aligning yourself to be used by God. The first one is this, create a place simple create a place create a place in in your regular rhythm to where you can just th this is an identified place that's that's different it's not that saying that places are sacred we are sacred we are the holy temple wherever we are god is with us but in the trying to create a daily habit create a place i have a place some many of the team uh, of our leadership team and our and our staff have a place maybe it's a chair you need to create and set aside that whenever i sit in this chair i'm going to connect with god and god i'm going to pray yes i'm going to talk to you but i'm going to do just as much listening as i do talking and i, I want to create a place 
Maybe it's, maybe it's in your car. Maybe it's, maybe it's a space at work that you can take some time out of your day, and on a break you can just go find it. Nobody's going to mess with you uninterrupted. Or even if it is interrupted, you can be focused for the time you are. But you need to create a place, and you need to create the place. See, it's not going to find you, but you need to make the place to find it. And then the second thing is that, find the time. Time isn't just going to show up on your doorstep one day. Oh, I got the time to pray. You know, we live in a busy world. We have to create the time. We have to make the time. We need to actively pursue finding the time. I, Jesus would go out in the morning to pray. I, I, tr- I do this, and this is part of my, I try to do this every morning. And the, one of the first things that's part of my routine is in a, in a place that I have that nobody else gets with me. And this is where I find the time, and I devote that moment, and I take the time to pray, and I find the time to pray. You, I encourage you, what do you need to do to find the time to pray? And then this, listen just as much as you talk. Listen, just if not more, just as much, if not more, than you talk. Listen. You know, when I pray, I, I, use, I use the scripture. And in this, I use this, and it positions me to listen. And I use what Jesus said, this is how you should pray. And you can look at the Lord's Prayer. Many of you grew up maybe memorizing the Lord's Prayer. And I'm a simple man, and my relationship with Jesus sometimes is simply complex, and this is one of the simply complex things I do in this, is I pray the Lord's Prayer every day. And, and, and if you are looking for a way to play, pray, I want you to just write these letters in, D-S-A, D-S-A. It's kind of like the format of the Lord's Prayer. It's first declaring the greatness of God. When Jesus says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. How, and I, I, in that moment, I declare how amazing my God is. You know what that does to me? When I declare, use my words to declare his greatness, my belief is built. I begin to build my faith by declaring how amazing my God is. And I begin to declare him. And then I get to this moment that I surrender my will. That's the second thing I do. I surrender to him. Lord's Prayer goes on to say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And I just take a moment and I say, Jesus, I want your will more than I want my way today. Some days I don't get past that. Some days I wrestle that down. Some days I can't get past that because I want him to know I want his will more than I want my way. And I listen. God, what's your will today? Where is your kingdom at work today? In whose life are you working in? Because your kingdom comes by and through people. Your kingdom comes through people. So when you ask me to pray for you, this is when I pray for you. And I, I pray Maybe not the way you want me to pray, but I pray the way God wants me to pray. I say, God, will you let your kingdom come through this family? Will your will be done in this family? Will your kingdom come through? Because I believe when we are surrendered to his plan and his will for us, then we are positioned. And, and that gets us in a position to listen. And this is where I listen. And then I declare, that's the D. I de- not the D, A, acknowledge my dependence. I acknowledge I acknowledge my dependence on him for my daily bread, for my provision every day. I acknowledge that God, okay, this is when I, after I get all this and I've listened, where's your kingdom to play? Okay, now, God, this, I need, I just want you to know I acknowledge you that I depend upon you for my daily bread today. And I pray for my neighbor's daily bread. I pray for my buddy who's going through a rough time. I pray that you provide for them. And then I acknowledge my dependence on him for his forgiveness in my life. God, I'm so grateful. And that, that I know that, you, that other people, they, that they're going to see your love and as I forgive them. So, I, I, man, I, I'm so grateful. And I acknowledge that I'm dependent upon your forgiveness of me. I'm so grateful for that. And I acknowledge my dependence on him to protect me from temptation. See, that's the Lord's prayer. And you know what that comes from? Scripture. And this is the last point. Include scripture in your prayer. I encourage you to, to include scripture in your prayer. We have a next step that's part of the 12, and if you haven't received one of these books, I encourage you to go to the in- info table back there and grab one of these. To, and this is where we're asking 500 people to take a next step in one of these 12 and share their story. And today I want to share a story of a guy named Bruce who's in this service right now, and Bruce serves. And he shared his story of taking this next step of 
regularly including scripture as a part of his life. And he writes this, he goes, I need to be brutally honest with myself. I feel Christ is the center of my life. But was I seeking him and his great wisdom? Bam! I needed to listen to him more. But how? My life is so busy, and how will I fit one more thing in? Notice that he says, I need to listen to him more. <laughs> he goes, I was hit with honesty again. God revealed to me that I need a better priority. I am blessed with a small commute to work. It provides a great time to start my day with Christ. I enjoy the YouVersion app, which is a Bible app that's free on all the devices. He goes, in this with a life moment devotionals over the years, and it has a wonderful devotion with Old and New Testament readings for a one-year Bible plan. It has the audio feature that is Bluetooth enabled. I did have to sacrifice my normal 80s rock morning radio talk, though, realizing now that it's really a trade up for my past routine to listen to Scripture. I find now this time is helping shape my day going into the office and transforming my Christ like attitude in my workday that overflows back home. I can be moody. It has helped me realize even that even past 50 years old, you can continue to grow, learn, and be a blessing. But you have to pursue it. I just passed day 100 in this plan and can see why others make this a part of their life each year. This has become my goal also. See, when you pray, you can listen, you can listen to Scripture, and that make that a part, but Scripture allows you to know that you can listen to God. And so this is my challenge to you. Would you join us in praying every day in a different way? Saying, God, it's not as much about what I want from you, but may I position myself and align myself with what you want from me. And here's a way that we want to help you do that. In your bulletin is an insert and on that insert, on this side that has this love, what if the church loves KC, there is a website that says blesseveryhome.com. I encourage you to go to blesseveryhome.com, and I want you to, I encourage you to sign up to get a daily email, uh, uh, an email. This daily email will send you five names or uh, some names of homes in your neighborhood using public information. That, that it will give you the names of the people around you that you can begin to pray. That God, will you... I, I pray for these people that your kingdom come. And will you join us in saying, God, we want to pray for our community. What would it look like if we, Walula, and hundreds of church, and, and uh, hundreds of thousands of others in the KC Metro begin to pray for our neighborhoods? What would it look like? Would you go to this website and sign up and you can select how many people you want to pray for in your neighborhood? I went to the max, I went for 100. Some of you show up on my list because you live close to me. And you are, I want you to know I'm praying that God's kingdom comes to you and through you. Will you join me in that? Also, I encourage you to text Love KC to this number, 74574. It's on your, uh, the bottom of your sh sheet. And you, there you can get a daily text my reminder uh, and the daily devotion via text throughout this series. It'll just be one text per day that you'll get every day while, through the duration of the series. And you can join with us in praying loving our city by praying for what God wants. Will you stand with me and allow me to pray for us today? And after I pray, our prayer partners are going to be available. Jesus, this is my prayer, that you overcome our unbelief. And will you give us the self-discipline to create a space, find the time, listen as much, if not more, than we talk. And use your inspired words to inspire our trust in you that can unlock the possibilities of what you want to do through us, your church, as we love our city by being a people who praise. In your name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you, Westside. We'll see you next week, and our prayer partners are available.